morning and welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Billy Sutherland. Let me introduce you to our team. This is James Wilkinson over here. He's going to be doing our scripture and prayer. Brother Jim Reeves is going to be leading our music. Sister Jenny Schoen is going to be accompanying on the piano and leading us in some singing, perhaps. We've got Riley over there. She'll be singing later on a special music. And then back in the sound booth, Curtis and Derek. Just want to let you know this is the second time that we've done live stream. We're working out all the bugs. We've heard your comments about you want to zoom in and all those kinds of things. What we're doing, just so you would know, is we're not just doing this to fix it for this time. We're trying to get it so that we can do this even after we're allowed to come back to church. Uh, we're going to continue to live stream. So uh, just try buying a zoom in camera or something like that, a webcam now. Every church on the planet is trying to buy them. So this is a work in progress, and we appreciate your patience. Uh, go ahead and text your friends, uh, message them, whatever you want to do. We are live streaming at uh, facebook.com slash Calvary Brenham. Later today, we'll post it on YouTube, and you can find everything on the website, calvarybrenham.org. It will have the recorded services from the past. It will have information on church hours and all those kinds of things but above all remember that God is not the author of confusion nor has he given us a spirit of fear it is all about trusting in him so let's sing about that Jim trust in Jesus thank you pastor well good morning church I hope you feel blessed this morning as we do to be here Jeremiah 17 says blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. So this morning we're going to trust and we're going to sing about trust. If you'll turn in your hymnals to hymn number 411, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." Father God, we come to you today proud and humbled and honored to be called your children. 
And as a perfect father, we know how much you care for us. We know that in times of stress that we're experiencing as a nation and around the world, that we would be lost were it not for the promise that we can trust in you and know that we will be blessed and know that you will care for us. Lord, as we come to you today, we desire that our worship may be in spirit and in truth. Lord, we're here about you. We love you. We ask that all that's said and done this morning might be in accordance with your will, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, church, I'd like to begin this part of the service, and you may be seated, those that are with us out here this morning, both of you. I would like to start by quoting an American philosopher that I'm sure that you all know, uh, Flip Wilson, or maybe if you don't remember Flip, maybe Joan Rivers, when they said, can we talk? I'd like to do that with you this morning. Those of you that are with us online, I'd like to speak to you. And it's easy in times like this to fall into a state of fear, depression, or anxiety. We must continually remind ourselves and those around us that our God is in total control. And He has a divine purpose for every circumstance we encounter even as we face the situation we're in today around the world. Daniel 9 says, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps His covenant and mercy with those who love Him and with those who keep His commandments. Isaiah 26, Trust in God forever. For in, the God, for in God the Lord we have an everlasting rock. Romans 15 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. I want to emphasize peace. May He fill us with peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I ask you, how powerful is your God? Do you doubt Him? How about His Son? Jesus told us in John 14, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, and we believe in God. Believe also in me. 1 Peter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, this is the part, who are protected by the power of God through faith. Do you trust Him? Turn with me, if you will, now to hymn number 447. And let's talk about that part that says, Trust and obey. And we just read about that. We not only need to trust, but we need to be obedient. Let's sing together. When we walk
just uh, another reminder, we are online only for now. Uh, Denise Romo is our coordinator for our ministries, ministry coordinator. She and I will be taking turns being in the office this week again. She'll be in Monday and Wednesday. I'll be here Tuesday and Thursday. So uh, phones are being monitored and answered. Calvary Baptist Church is still alive and well. We are here. We're just not allowed to have a whole bunch of people in here with us. So uh, we, we do want to make one note. A sad note, uh, Gene Arnold is one of our charter members. Uh, he passed away this week. Uh, his family is rejoicing, though, that he knew Jesus and uh, is spending time with him. But just to show you the difficulty of these times, I wasn't even allowed to go comfort the family, and they were barely allowed into the hospital to, to be with uh, uh, Brother Gene as he passed. So be in prayer for them. Uh, then Easter Sunday, we don't know. It's looking like probably we will not be together here again for Easter Sunday. It looks like we'll be doing that live. That's also our Lord's Supper Sunday. So I would encourage you. We've talked a whole bunch of different ways of doing this, a drive through or whatever. What I would encourage you right now is we have a couple of weeks. Uh, go ahead and get yourself some Welch's grape juice. Put it in your fridge. Hang on to it. Uh, I think HEB sells matzah. You can get a little bit of that or any bread this is one of those times i don't think god is going to be judgmental looking down to kill us if we don't behave or he's going to honor the intent of our heart so we're going to do communion live we'll uh, share it here those of us who are here and then we'll be instructing you our audience at home and you can share in communion with us so we're making uh, preparations to share that online we're hoping for the best preparing for the worst children's message uh, children are not here. I see some in the audience, but those are our cartoon figures. We're so glad to have them with us. Uh, we do have on our website color pages. If you go to calvarybrenham.org, right now there's a, I think it's a purple streamer that comes across the front page that uh, tells about the coloring pages. If you click on that, or if you go to the ministries heading of our website and uh, click on ministries and then click on children, you can download some color pages to color, or you can, as some have already done, just create your own, mail them to us, send them by carrier pigeon, fax them, take pictures, scan them, however you want to get them to us. And this is not just Calvary Kids. This is any kid in the world. You can send us pictures. And then if you go to that uh, website, you'll see that we already have a couple of them. Morgan's already done her homework. We already have a couple of her pictures there. So in closing, wash your hands and say your prayers because Jesus and germs are everywhere. That was our last live children's message here in the auditorium, but the message still applies. Now we're going to try something we have never done before. Charlie and Ramona have been very faithful at Calvary. They've presented special music on a number of occasions. As many of you know, Ramona has been having all kinds of challenges with cancer and uh, surgeries and in the hospital and they've not been here for a while but they have recorded some music so from home we're going to play some uh, special music for uh, from Charlie and Ramona right now That sweet home on high, I'll live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, yes I'll live in glory by and by. I'll tell them, and sing that story. There on high, there with my dear Redeemer, no more to die. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. Bye and bye, I'll tell 
come and sing the story. There on high, there was my dear Redeemer. No more to die. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. Well, those of you with us today, at home, on the air, there's one key to the peace that we desire right now in our world. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, that is the peace that we experience, is our faith in Him. So we're going to sing now hymn number 320, and we're going to ask you, if you don't know Him, turn your eyes upon Jesus. church what a fantastic day to be here in the lord's house today's verse will come from john 11 we're going to read verses 38 through 41 you see there 38 through 41a now if you look in your bibles there is no 41a but today we're going to make an a out of it so we're going to stop before we get to the end of verse 41 so if you again uh, john 11 if you'll turn in your bibles with me then jesus said Deeply moved again, come to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone, Martha. The sister of the dead man said to the Lord, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. God bless the reading of his word. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? 
Dear holy and gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today in these times of trouble to put our trust and faith in you. We ask that you open both our hearts and our minds as we hear the message today and be with us as we go through our daily lives. These things we ask in your most precious and holy word. Amen. Church, not only is Jesus, the Lamb of God, worthy, He's holy. Turn with me to hymn number two. We're going to sing, Holy, Holy, Holy.
And you may be seated. This is a time we normally would take up our offering. Uh, we don't have a big promotion online for online giving. I think we'll put that there eventually. But the main thing right now is uh, Calvary Baptist Church does not need your money. God does not need your money. The fact is we need to give. And uh, we can give to our local church. We can give to our neighbors helping out. Uh, check with your neighbors and see what their situation is. As much as social distancing, distancing allows, you know, we're going to help each other out. Uh, if you'd like to give, uh, contact information is on our website. Again, calvarybrenham.org. I have to confess that this is a little challenging. Um, I can't see what you're seeing at home. I can see my screens here. Uh, we're sitting here while Charlie and Ramona were. I trust that that went well, and I trust that you got to see that, getting thumbs up from the soundboard. So we are still working this out. Uh, we're just glad to be here and uh, sharing with you. Now one of my favorite choruses, Janie's going to lead us in, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. We are in the book of John. Platform people, you're excused. Jim, that means you can go sit. <laughs> Don't want him sitting there picking his nose or something during the sermon. Jesus is the resurrection. We started this last Sunday in the Gospel of John, so turn your Bibles with me to the Gospel of John. I'm in the King James this morning, uh, not because I'm King James only or anything like that, it just happens to be that that's what I've memorized all of my scripture in. And when I try to read ESV, which I like to preach from, but when I'm trying to read a familiar passage, it gets tangled up. Besides that, as I mentioned last Sunday, I just kind of like the King James, how it says when uh, James was reading the um, scripture, he read from the ESV, and he got to say that you can't open the tomb because there will be an odor. I get to say because it stinketh. So we're going to be in uh, John chapter 11, the Gospel of John. John is very close to Jesus, of course, so close that at the cross, Jesus gave his mother to John, and he gave John 
to his mother. Uh, John is not one of the synoptic gospels. Uh, used to be I had a hard time remembering which were the synoptic gospels, and I'd try. There's three of the four. All you have to remember is John's not one of them, and you got it made. While the others are parables and miracles and, and uh, different things, the Gospel of John is often called the Book of Signs because John centers his whole Gospel around seven signs, and they are very quickly Jesus turning the water into wine in chapter 2, healing the royal uh, official son in chapter 4, healing the paralytic at Bethesda, feeding the 5,000 in chapter 6, walking on water in chapter 6, healing the man blind from birth in chapter 9, and then raising of Lazarus where we are this morning in chapter 11. So we're looking at the seventh of uh, the seven signs. Last Sunday it was about Jesus and his friends and that Jesus waited two days when word had gone to him that Lazarus was dead. There was that confusion over whether he was asleep or Jesus used that term. And by the way, if you look in the New Testament, those who are asleep, that only refers to the followers of Jesus. That only refers to the redeemed. We don't refer to lost people that way, that they're asleep. It's a euphemism that uh, Jesus had to explain because the disciples says, well, if he's sleeping, then he must be doing better. Jesus said plainly, Lazarus is dead. Then we mentioned that Martha was one of the ones who said, uh, it's all your fault. And I want to soften that a little bit. I want to clarify that uh, we don't know that that was her intent. We just know that she's making the observation Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It could just as much have been a statement of faith. Um, we trusted on you, but again, there's that disappointment because we sent word to you that your, that, that your friend Lazarus was sick, and instead of coming right away, you waited, and uh, now he's dead. So uh, Jesus had the opportunity to explain. Um, it's not just about the resurrection in the future. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Two of the I am statements here out of the many that Jesus made, I am the resurrection and I am the life. So today, Martha told Mary, the master is here and he wants to talk to you. That's in John chapter 11, verse 28. And I find this almost comical because we don't see that Jesus actually told Martha to tell Mary, Jesus wants to talk to you. This is just in the narrative. It uh, kind of reminds me when we were growing up, I was raised in a family of nine children, and somebody was always in trouble. Uh, a lot of times it was me. And uh, somebody would say, hey, mom's upset, and she wants to talk to you. And you kind of think, you know, sometimes you just said that because you wanted that little higher authority, so you threw mom under the bus like that. Mom wants to see you. Don't know exactly what's going on here, but Martha told Mary, the master is here. He wants to talk to you. So Mary went to Jesus. The Jews had been in the house, so they all get up and they're following because they think she's going to the grave. That's verse 31. And the same story, if you had come, my brother would not have died. Now, obviously, they discussed this at home because they got their stories together. Martha had said it first, and now Mary says it. If you had come, my brother would not have died. So there in verse 33, and that's where we'll start seriously looking at the Scripture, Jesus groaned in the Spirit. It says, When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and saw the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. That groaning in the spirit is a, an interesting thing. And uh, one of these days we'll go into a deeper study on that, but we find the groaning in the spirit here. He groans again in a few verses. Uh, we see Paul talking about groanings in the spirit that, that uh, we can understand. Uh, he was troubled. Jesus was a man. He was God. He was the God-man Christ Jesus. And in his humanity, he got hungry. He got thirsty. He got tired. He had personal emotions. And here he's very troubled. And they said to him, and, uh, and he said, Where have you laid him? They said, Come and see. I think at this point it really came down to, Okay, this is really it. Lazarus is in the, group, is, is in the tomb. I've heard lots of sermons and theories and ideas about Jesus wept here. And one of the things we know that he did not weep for, he was not weeping because Lazarus was dead, because he knew Lazarus was about to live again. So your, your theories about why Jesus wept, there are three times in the Scripture where Jesus weeps. Uh, one of them is here. 
One of them is where he's weeping over the city of Jerusalem. And uh, he, he weeps over the sinful condition of man. So I would kind of think that that's what it's talking about here. Jesus wept over the sinful condition of man. Uh, and then the other one was Jesus wept in the garden of Gethsemane. So those are the three times. Verse 36, Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. They're making the assumption that Jesus is weeping because he loved Lazarus. As we already said, I don't think that's it because Jesus knows that Lazarus is about to be living again. Verse 37, And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind, that had happened in John chapter 9, have caused that even this man should not have died? Now, here's where I like to point out, too many times what we do is we bring a solution to Jesus. This is what we want you to do. This is, God, this is, what you, this is the result that I want. Instead of bringing the problem and letting God provide his own solution. Uh, when I was in IT at CDM many years ago, uh, there would be from time to time somebody would come rushing in and say, the server's dead, the server's dead. How do you know the server's dead? Well, I can't get into the accounting. Can anybody else in your work group there get into it? Well, yeah, Sue can get into accounting. Okay, well, then the server's not dead. Why don't you just bring me the problem and, and let me provide the solution? So what's happening here is they're pretty much assigning Jesus the solution. We want you to come and heal Lazarus. What Jesus was there to do, though, was, it says earlier in a chapter, so that you can see the glory of God. He said, I'm glad that I wasn't there for your sake, so you can see the glory of God. So the criticism is, doesn't Jesus have the power to heal Lazarus since he had the power to heal the blind man from his blindness? Verse 38, Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself. And personally, this is my personal opinion, I think this is just the overwhelming unbelief and untrust and lack of faith in him. He cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. I get kind of choked up when I read that because it's just a short time after this that there's another cave and another stone. We're approaching Holy Week. We're approaching the Easter season. Uh, we will be celebrating and observing Good Friday and then the resurrection of Jesus. Th this is just a short time after what we're talking about now. This time, Jesus is standing on this side of the stone. The next time, Jesus will be laying on the other side of the stone it says it was a cave and a stone lay upon it verse 39 Jesus said and this is one of two instructions or commands that he gives the crowd take ye away the stone I always like to point out that these two things that Jesus said one was take away the stone and a little bit after Lazarus has risen from the dead we're going to see that Jesus says loose him and set him free because he came bound hand and foot with grave clothes out of the tomb but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. He says, take away the stone. Could not Jesus have taken away the stone? Absolutely. He could have blasted it with his power and, or picked it up and launched it into space. He could have moved it with his own supernatural power because he is God in the flesh. But I think it was instructive that he was telling the church, the people standing around, his followers, and a testimony to all those who were there who were unbelievers take the stone away this is a classic case of you do what you can do so that God can do what he can do and then you can go back to doing what you can do I like that expression that we use here from time to time pray like it all depends on God work like it all depends on you don't just sit around praying for something if God puts it on your heart to do something about it oftentimes we are the hands and feet of Jesus so then Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. There's that great King James word. For he hath been dead four days. Jewish legend said that the soul hovered above the dead body for three days. And then after that, all hope was lost. You still could commune with the dead and so on and so forth. So the four days is significant there. All hope is gone. Lazarus is dead. Nothing anybody can do about it except, of course, Jesus, who was God. So then verse 40, Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God? Again, that's what I believe it was verse 4. 
He said, guys, I'm glad that we were here because you're going to see the glory of God. This is not a sin. This is not a sickness unto death, but this is a sickness unto the glory of God. And he asked them, didn't I say, and, and this has been the thing going along because when he was talking to Martha about the resurrection, she says, I know that my brother will rise again in the last days. Jesus says, no, no, no. I am the resurrection and the life. And he's wanting her so much to believe as we started off the service talking about trusting, trusting Jesus, trust and obey. They need to trust Jesus and obey when he says, take the stone away, just trust him and obey and do it. When we talk about the seven signs that John talks about in the Gospel of John, the first one we mentioned, of course, was the turning water into wine. And I love in that story when uh, Jesus is there and they've run out of wine and uh, Mary, his mother, turns to the crowd and points to Jesus and says, whatever he says, do it. That ought to be the purpose of our life. That ought to be the goal of our life. That ought to be why we exist. Whatever Jesus says, do it. When Jesus says, take away the stone, don't argue, don't find excuses, don't do it. Jesus said unto her, said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldst believe, thou should see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And again, sometimes we just go charging through the scripture without thinking about what's actually going on. What's going on in Jesus' mind as he's seeing them take the stone away from the grave where Lazarus is on the other side of the stone in and he's dead. Jesus will be facing that scenario later on himself. And as they're taking away the stone, I wonder if it entered into Jesus' mind, yeah, there's coming a time for me that the stone will be rolled away also. And he lifted up his eyes. He does something interesting here. He lifts up his eyes and he says, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Now, this is interesting. It's, it's kind of like, um, well, let's just go on because he explains what it is. Verse 42 and I knew thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So Jesus was praying this prayer to the Father so that the people around could hear. And, and he's explaining this to God, not because God doesn't know this, but because the people need to hear it. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice. And that's crucial that's important something is about to happen either jesus is going to be revealed as a hoax because he's calling a dead man from the grave and he's not going to come out or jesus is going to be proven to have power even over death again this is the third time that we see that jesus raises somebody from the dead and i might hasten to add that that doesn't mean that it's only happened three times in the bible because john goes on at the end of his uh, gospel to explain that there are many other things that Jesus did the which if they should be written down every one I suppose the world itself could not contain the volumes that could be written Jesus may have raised other people from the dead but a significant event as that was I'm tending to believe that we would have seen that in the scripture from one of the gospel writers he cried with a loud voice not embarrassed not just a hey Lazarus come forth he cried with a loud voice and everybody around heard, and all eyes were on the cave. The stone is moved away. It's cold and dark in there. There's a dead body inside, and the world is watching and waiting, and, and they're peering in. And I can just imagine that some of the people are saying, boy, isn't this going to be great because this is the Lord of the universe, the master. Of the, he spoke the world into existence, and now he can speak to a dead body, and a dead body can. This is just going to be fantastic. I imagine there may have been others standing there saying, oh, he's really blown at this time. <laughs> he's, he's just really bitten off more than he can chew. A dead body coming out of a tomb like that that's been dead for four days, it's just not going to happen. And then I imagine there might be some people standing there thinking, boy, I hope this works. I really do. I want so badly to believe in Jesus. And, and if, this, if this really happens, then, then I will know that this is the Son. Nonetheless, there are these people, believers and unbelievers alike, and they're watching, and uh, Jesus cries with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Earlier in the Gospel of John, we have this little explanation about there will be a voice to those who are in the dead, and they will come out of the graves. And um, a lot of people like to preface this by saying, when Jesus says, Lazarus, 
he mentioned him by name. Because if he had just said, come forth, everybody else might have come out of the graves too. I don't know if that would happen or not. When he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Years ago at another church I was preaching, and we had a Hispanic pastor for our Hispanic mission in Magnolia. And I was preaching, and Rod was doing the translating. It was interesting because Rod's native language was Portuguese. He learned English to come to the United States, and then he wanted to pastor to Hispanic congregations, so he learned Spanish. So as I'm preaching, and he's standing next to me translating, I'm just marveling because this man is translating from his second language into his third language. We, we got mixed up a little bit. There was a time when uh, he said something. I said, uh, uh, you can be free as a bird. And he said something, and everybody giggled. And his wife stage whispered. Apparently, he'd used the Portuguese word instead of the Spanish word. And it just didn't fit at all. But as I, I got to this part, and I cried. I said, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Rod over here says, and Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And I looked at him, I said, Rod, there's something wrong, because I understood that. He got so excited about that that he forgot about the translating, and he got to preaching himself. This is shouting stuff, because it's not going to be long at all before Jesus rises from the dead himself. Verse 44, and he that was dead came forth. Now imagine the scene again. Here's this dead man in the tomb. He was prepared for death, not embalmed, but prepared for death, bound hand and foot with grave clothes and a napkin covered his face he was all bound up and Jesus called him to come forth he couldn't just come running out there and say here I am he, he had to get up and struggle and I, I know this is not very gracious but maybe even had to bunny hop <laughs> because his feet however he did it he had to struggle to come out of that tomb so during that time that Jesus calls forth Lazarus come forth just imagine the electricity that must have been in the air as everybody staring and they're watching and then all of a sudden they see him come out and I imagine there were some praise gods spoken I imagine there were some <gasps> that was a tremendous moment and then Jesus gives his other command instruction he says loose him and let him go he's bound hand and foot with grave clothes so he can't run up and hug the master. He can't even fall at his feet and worship. He can't see Jesus' face. He's all bound up, and Jesus could have himself gone and taken the grave clothes off, but Jesus turned to those that were there and said, Loose him and set him free. Loose him and let him go. He gave that instruction to the church. So again, there are things that we can do. There are things that only God can do. But so many times, I wonder if there are things that God would do, but He's waiting for us to do what we can do. Verse 45, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on Him. Now, pastors would love it if they preached to lost people and every time every person who was lost got saved, it just doesn't happen. Didn't even happen for Jesus. Didn't happen for Peter. Didn't happen for Paul. Sometimes, as we see in verse 46, but some of them went their ways to the Pharisees, talk about some tattletales, and told them what things Jesus had done. And we're ending our scripture part there, but let me just give you some insight. What happened then is the bad guys got together, the Taliban got together, and they said, all right, we got to get rid of Lazarus. We, gotta, we can't have a dead man come back to life and walking around, and everybody, hey, there's Lazarus, Jesus they, they were going to kill him again. He was going to be dead again. But let's get back to Jesus as the resurrection. And the whole theme of the message this morning, the whole theme of the, the, the morning this morning is, Jesus is the resurrection. Trust him. Trust him when he says, fill these pitchers with water and, and then it turns into wine. Trust him when he says, take the stone away. Trust him when he says, I am the resurrection and the life just do what he says so the the stone that was rolled away or the stone that was moved that Jesus asked the church or instructed the church take the stone away maybe there are stones in your life that are keeping God from doing a miracle 
for you or in you or through you. There could be the stone of disbelief. We see that there are times that Jesus tried to minister or went to minister, and he could do no great miracles there because of their unbelief. There could be the sin of uh, the stone of procrastination. I I'm, I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'm going to give my life to Jesus. Tomorrow, I'm going to give up this, whatever it is. Tomorrow, I'm going to... There's that sin of procrastination. And then there's the stone of unconfessed sin, which really incorpor incorporates these other ones, the disbelief and the procrastination. The unconfessed sin is uh, there's something that separates you from fellowship with Jesus. I don't believe that you can lose your salvation, but you can sure lose your fellowship when you're in sin might be that the stone that needs to be moved from your heart is anger with a brother or somebody even gets crossways with a pastor or gets angry with a the church they get their feelings hurt the the choir minister or the choir leader did something or, or or didn't let them sing their special or there's all kinds of reasons why people get upset but so many of these things can be the stone that blocks god from doing what he wants to do in our lives so i like to look at this and say not only did we see Jesus give the job to the church to take the stone away so that he can do a great miracle, I wonder if there's works that God wants to do in our own lives, in our own church, in our own nation, in our own world. But there's the stone that's in the way. And sure, Jesus could remove the stone, but just like in John chapter 11, he turned to the people, the church, he said, you take the stone away. What stone is there in your life that needs to be removed for you to trust him not just to trust him but to trust and obey whatever he says do it let's pray father we thank you for your love thank you for the privilege of being here this morning thank you lord for people who are watching on live stream or later on on youtube in their homes and I pray, Father, that if there's somebody out there who does not know you as Savior, that this would be the day that they decide it's time to settle up with Jesus. I pray, Father, if there's somebody out there, maybe they know that they're saved, but they're not living for Jesus. There's something preventing them from living for you, for, uh, for you and for you living through them and from having the fellowship that they need with you. I pray, Father, that they would look at their own hearts just like we're going to do communion in a couple of Sundays. And one of the things that we ask is, let a man examine himself. What is it, Father, that I need to take out of my life? What is it that I need to add into my life? Father, help us to have the courage to trust you and to obey. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have made a decision to accept Christ as Savior, or if you have something you'd like to we'd like to hear from you again our website calvarybrenham.org uh, where phones are monitored uh, we want to hear from you so um, god bless let's stand again and sing and as we've heard today in our message jesus said did i not say to you that if you believe you will see the glory of god him for is to god be the glory
peeked in last night as Sheldon Riley was uh, doing some announcements for his Elevate Church in West Texas. This is uh, Ramona and Charlie's son, and I was commenting there, and he was reading them, and he was talking about how much he missed his congregation. And I said, but there's going to be a grand reunion. And he said, yes, Pastor Billy, a grand reunion. We'll have not just when we get back, you know, when we can all get back to church. Won't that be a great thing? But then look forward to the grand reunion in heaven that we're going to have. We get to practice that when this is all done. That concludes our service. But if you'd like to stay around just a little while, Janie's going to play some music, and then we'll close. Thank you. 